Tragedy struck the boxing and sporting community today when fighter Maxim Dadashev passed away as a result of injuries sustained at a recent fight. For those new to my page, my name's Brian and I'm a doctor and a sports fan and it's my goal on this channel to combine those interests to help explain different sports injuries, sports medicine type topics in a way that you guys can learn from and better understand. Usually on this page, we're talking about things like ACL tears, Achilles tears, ankle sprains, stuff that's trivial and minor compared to something like what happened this past weekend. But I want this to be a place where you guys can come to learn about this type of stuff when we see it happen and when we see it in the news and be a good kind of learning resource for you all and stuff like this happens as tragic as it might be. What I wanna do in the video today is first off, just very briefly review what exactly happened in terms of the bleed in the brain that caused this to occur. But primarily I wanna take this as an opportunity to help teach you more about what should be these kind of warning signs and symptoms that would suggest that someone's at risk of or is suffering a much more serious head injury like this. Whether you're a mixed martial artist, a boxer, or just playing any other sport where you're at risk of a concussion, it's really crucial and important to understand kind of what signs and symptoms to look for in yourself and others so that hopefully we can prevent these types of tragedies from happening. The report is that Dadashev sustained a subdural hematoma and ultimately passed away as a result of increased pressure buildup in the brain. Whenever you get hit in the head, whether it's in a sporting event or just falling and hitting your head on the ground, these types of episodes with bleeding in the brain are really what's most dangerous. There's three key ones that I wanna teach you about real quick. The difference in all these is where the bleeding occurs in the brain. The first one to talk about is what happened with Dadashev, and that's a subdural hematoma. The dura is part of the lining that covers your brain tissue, and so subdural hematoma implies that there's bleeding or a hematoma beneath that dura, beneath that outer layer around the brain. In this case, it's not actually the brain tissue itself that is bleeding or got bruised. It's the veins that run across the brain that get torn or sheared apart that cause that blood to develop. If it doesn't clot off, that blood keeps accumulating in this space and pushes the brain tissue away. And that pushing of the brain tissue is what's ultimately most dangerous. Another one you'll hear about is an epidural hematoma. And this is when there is damage or bleeding from an artery that's outside of the dura. So again, it's not actual damage or bleeding of the brain tissue itself. It's tearing of a blood vessel that runs outside of the brain that then bleeds into the space and pushes on the brain. The third type is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is where there's actually bleeding contained more inside the brain itself. It's reported that with Dadashev, he developed increased intracranial pressure because of this bleeding in the brain and ultimately required surgery to try to relieve the pressure. When your brain is sitting in the skull, that's a firm, rigid space. The skull can't expand. And so if you have blood going into an area of the brain, the brain can't go anywhere. And so if that blood builds up enough, it pushes on the brain and increases that pressure in the space. If the brain gets pushed on enough, then it can affect different structures in the brainstem that control your breathing and that control your consciousness. If the pressure gets too high and isn't relieved, then you can go into a coma or you can have respiratory or cardiac arrest just from that pressure on your brainstem. So what the surgeons will try to do is either give medicines to reduce that pressure in the brain or in this case, they'll go in and actually do a surgery where they try to get that blood clot out of the brain, and in some cases even take a piece of the skull off to relieve that pressure so that the brain has room to expand without pushing on the nearby structures. What I want you to take away from this though is what you should be watching for that might suggest someone's at risk of having a much more serious head injury. These are all symptoms related to this increased intracranial pressure. The first to think about is worsening headache. Now, of course, if you've just gotten knocked out or hit with a punch, your head's probably gonna hurt. But if you start developing a headache that gets worse and worse and worse and builds up over time, that could be a sign that that pressure is increasing in the brain and something more sinister is going on. Also, nausea and vomiting. Whenever we see someone who has a head injury that's vomiting, that raises much higher concern for a more serious injury. Sometimes when this happens, we can actually see changes in the pupils where the pupils don't react to light appropriately. They can become very small and constricted indicating there could be some herniation developing in the brain. In general, the person will become much more somnolent, much more sleepy and just out of it as that pressure builds up as well. So whenever someone has a head injury or has a concussion, any sign of stuff getting worse, nausea, vomiting, worsening headaches, they're sleepy, their breathing becomes depressed, are all symptoms and signs that something more serious could be going on and should have much further attention. Nobody will deny that boxing and mixed martial arts are extremely dangerous and violent sports. Whenever things like this happen, it makes me consider what I might do if I were in that situation 
where I'm monitoring that fight or I'm trying to watch and see and protect those athletes. In hindsight, I don't think there's anything they could have done to prevent this. Whenever things seemed to get really bad, the fight was called off, but of course, as we know by then, it was too late. The whole goal of these events is to knock the other person out, and so you're trying to induce a concussion and a brain injury in this person. And so when you have the responsibility of monitoring their safety and trying to have their best interest in mind, you can't be too overly aggressive to where you'll pull someone out who might be able to keep fighting. Then at the same time, you have to be aware of when things like this could be happening that put the person's life at risk. I truly don't think there's anybody to blame here. Looking back at how he was reacting, he was responding to questions, he was talking to the trainer. Certainly he looked more out of it, but that's what happens after you're in a boxing match and you're getting punched in the head. But certainly in the future, if you see a fighter who's throwing up, who's becoming sleepy, very drowsy, and not responding to questions, if you notice changes in the pupils or you start to notice weakness in one of the arms or the legs, these could all be concerns that there's something more serious going on like bleeding in the brain. So for anybody out there who's a boxer, who's a fighter of any sort or who's playing sports, be aware of these types of things. Be cognizant of what's going on with your teammates, with the other people who are fighting. Watch for these sorts of things. Try to pick up if you notice anything's off or out of place because that really could be the difference between life and death.